<laughs> okay, today I'm going to talk about Java binding and tips and tricks and stuff. And sorry to say I'm Japanese. I, my, I'm not using this weird English language every day. So <laughs> it is weird. <laughs> so bear, in, bear with it. <laughs> So today's agenda is like, I'm going to talk about the Java, Java binding stuff, but how many people are uh, using Xamarin Android? Okay, half of those-ish. And have anyone ever tried to bind some Java libraries? Oh, actually a lot. Wow, I was surprised. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm going to talk about the Java binding stuff. Uh, it's, I have to say it's mostly targeting whoever tried to bind some Java libraries. But <coughs> And uh, it's about mostly about tips and tricks of the newest, mm -hmm. latest stuff and the hottest stuff. I have to say Java binding is not really hottest <laughs> topic in Xamarin world, but <laughs> it's part of the hottest uh, in the Java binding area. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some futuristic topics about the Java binding stuff. There are a couple of new stuff too. <coughs> okay, uh, first of all, <coughs> In Xamarin Android X system, we have a couple of libraries that we can use to develop applications. The most essential ones are framework libraries that is under system something. And we also have um, the core framework assembly for Xamarin Android itself, which is usually mono.android.dll. And Java binding is similar to that Xamarin Android framework assembly. It is uh, mostly f um, to make use of Java libraries for Xamarin Android. Uh, recently, we have a couple of other similar technologies that is not limited to Xamarin Android, which is called Embedinator Native 4000, but I'm not going to talk about that today. And Java binding is mostly to generate .NET -fied API. Usually Java bindings, are, uh, Java libraries are written in Java and you're, you're seeing them either in Java or AAR. But uh, the Java binding is to make use of them within the .NET applications. Why do you want to use Java bindings? <laughs> it is mostly to achieve more native Java Android oriented experiences. <coughs> You guys always have less uh, native experience with Xamarin Android because not all Java libraries are available. But so make to give more native experience, you need to bind those Java libraries into the .NET land first. And it is important to respect the platform nature like you, you guys can always write some application, uh, say, especially in cross-platform application using Xamarin Forms. But Xamarin Forms is more like a common <coughs> greatest <coughs> measure, ZCM. Like your ability is kind of limited to the common subset. But actually Xamarin Forms is cool enough to bring some ability to extend some native-oriented feature too. But to bring it, for, you need to learn about the, underli the underlying platform, which is either Android or iOS, and, how, and you need to know how to make it use from .NET. Is it working? Oh yeah, keep, keep okay. going, keep going. All right. Don't mind okay. So, which are Java bindings, for example, like? What you can already do, <coughs> what you can already use in Xamarin Android land from Java. The first of all, we have Android support libraries in Xamarin uh, and Xamarin.Android support something. They are already available on NuGet. Oh, my screenshot is kind of weird, like it's from Ubuntu, but you, you can really use it. But <coughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's kind of weird. Okay. Speaking up a little tiny bit. Huh? Louder. Louder. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Can you hear the back? All right. Can you guys actually see the screen? Okay. It's big. Probably. Sorry, I can't make it bigger right now. <laughs> the second one is Google Play Services bindings. Like Google Play Services, mm -hmm. of course, uh, are offered as a Java libraries and. There's a bunch of features like Google Maps and Firebase and <coughs> a lot of the stuff. You can use them from .NET too. Like our, uh, we have some 
team called component team and the component team keeps generating a lot of java bindings day by day <coughs> and google play service is part of those and there are a couple of other third party libraries like facebook sdk or lot have you ever heard of lotti it is for anime uh, creating animations or uh, the <coughs> the latest android trend is using kotlin instead of java Kotlin language has some framework library by itself. And we, uh, if we want to make use of Kotlin libraries, we need to bind them first. And there are already someone who bound the Kotlin library too. Or if you want to create some AR application using the latest uh, AR core stuff from Google, we already, uh, we, I found some bindings that, from that too. It can be anything. And the f lastly, even the framework library mono.android DLL itself is a Java binding library. So there's a lot of things that you can learn from mono.android. And we have the Xamarin components GitHub repository. <coughs> so you can find a lot. And beyond that, if you want to find some cool Java libraries, you can look for some <coughs> GitHub repositories that says like, there's always something called awesome blah blah thing. Like, uh, I'm showing awesome Android UI, for example, now. I like this repository because it, it shows a lot of nice UI libraries and it's, it shows some screenshot and even in different animations. <coughs> so you can see what this library can do and that library can do and there is a bunch. Wow. It is really cool stuff. You, want to, you might want to check out later. <coughs> I'm going back to the slide now. So Oops. Which, which this oh, it was uh, called uh, uh, Awesome Android UI from GitHub Wasabi. Wasabi. <laughs> <laughs> it is a weird <laughs> Japanese snack name. <laughs> it goes well together. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so they are usually, uh, those Java libraries are usually available via something called JCenter. It is like a NuGet for Java to explain for you guys. <laughs> and they are using Maven uh, build system, packaging system. And notice that not all Java libraries are for Android. Like, it's like, retrieving some packages from NuGet. Like if you are searching for some packages from NuGet, they are not always for Xamarin. So you will find that some things are not available for Android too. Let me explain how Java bindings works in, uh, briefly. I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time because it's a very in-depth to topic and it can be like one, one another hour, but I don't have a lot of time today. <laughs> Basically, Java bindings things makes use of the <coughs> uh, some interoperability layer between Java and C called the JNI, Java Native in Interoperability or Interface, maybe. <coughs> and we make use of it. Basically, we use the Mono runtime, which is a managed runtime for the cross-platform and Mono and Linux, whatsoever. And we use that for Xamarin Android and it is usable from C API. So we combine those JNI stuff and that lib, uh, lib mono library stuff together and we interoperate between Java and .NET. The key point here is Java implementation code doesn't really matter. We just invoke the Java API from the Dalvik or Art Java uh, virtual machine for Android. The actual runtime which runs Java code is them, theirs, not ours. So we only care about the API surface. The Xamarin Android <laughs> binding project only generates the API wrappers. The core part, core part is, and I'm explaining a little bit more. Uh, the core part is uh, the C API, C++ API called JNI env. And we have, have you, have you ever heard of p-invoke 
system in .NET. Basically, .NET has a feature to invoke C API from .NET code. And since this JNIM thing is based on the native API, there is, it is possible to invoke the feature from .NET code. So we have some managed library that called, it's called java.interop.jni environment, which is doing this pinbox stuff over JNIM. And it is actually implemented in very new assembly that we have developed we, keep, we have been developing called java.interop DLL. It is actually cross-platform PCL in PCL manner. <coughs> so if any adventurous hacker want to try you to use it from, say, uh, .NET desktop, say desktop Linux or desktop Mac or Windows, it would be possible to make use of it. <coughs> It is uh, in, on GitHub, of course. It, everything, I mean, the late, latest Xamarin Android platform code is all open source on GitHub. And historically, we had some different code, uh, class called android.runtime.jnim, and it is only for backband compatibility and in mono.android mono DLL, which is in different assembly. <coughs> I'm explaining that mostly because it, it is kind of extensible, so if you want to use it outside Xamarin Android, it is possible. <laughs> okay, now, from now I'm going to explain some project structure related tips and tricks for Xamarin Android binding projects. <coughs> Basically, when you are building, uh, creating Java binding project, you, uh, you launch the IDE, Visual Studio Mac, or uh, Visual Studio for for Windows, I, it's a weird, um, just say Visual Studio. <laughs> and create this new project and a new project and select Java binding library. And then you add some Java library to the project. Like, uh, can I see I'm moving some mouse cursor around, <laughs> maybe. Uh, you add some Java library to the project and then add some reference package, uh, reference package, NuGet package, and some assemblies. <coughs> and then optionally, you can uh, even add some Java docs to the, uh, to the project to fill some parameters. I'm going to explain that later. And you usually have to edit metadata XML for binding API. If it, uh, there are a couple of people who ever tried to create a Java binding project, and usually it doesn't work because you need to fix some API, and this metadata XML is a key thing. I'm going to explain that in depth later. And then uh, usually you hit F5 to, uh, or F8 or F6 to build the project and until it succeeds. And here's a breakdown of how Java bindings are built. And we generally have three steps. The first step is to export some a and the Java API to into XML, which is called API.xml. And the second step is to <coughs> actually generate the C sharp binding code from this API XML with some fix up from metadata XML or some other reference assemblies like <clears throat> when you are using uh, creating some uh, binding some java uh, binding library for some java library that depends on android dot support thing you usually have to add assembly uh, reference assembly for xamarin dot android dot support something and then once the binding gen is generated successfully the last step is to compile everything you can give some additional code here too. And then once it is, su it is successful, then you get the outcome DLL. Okay, I'll, I'm gonna explain, explain a little bit more about the first step. The export JAT XML step is to ex extract the Java API from JAR to XML. The reason why we do it now is to enable, uh, to make it possible to fix or revise the XML API for the later steps. And 
recently we we wrote some uh, ex uh, extractor tool which is now called class pass which is basically a .NET tool, .NET library, and uh, .NET tool to extract, uh, analyze the Java bytecode class to, <laughs> into XML. It sounds weird, but we used to have that tool in Java. We wrote some Java code to extract the API, but it was kind of problematic because running the reflection-based code on this uh, on Java always kind of bind. <laughs> binds to the runtime that is running the tool <laughs> itself. So when I, we are extracting Android API for Java API, it was actually generating some Java API metadata from Java SDK from Oracle, <laughs> which was weird. So we needed to, to fix that. And we are maintaining the tool only, uh, that, uh, only in .NET now. So basically, it should have no impact for new uh, you guys or whoever creates new projects. But if you have been developing some binding library from many years ago, or maybe a couple of years ago, you have some projects that does not have this class pass option by default. We basically don't have this property by default because of backward compatibility. So all the binding projects still use this JAR to XML stuff, but the new projects from IDEs always use this class pass stuff. So you usually don't have to worry about much about that. But if you have very old project, you might want to add some MS build property directly in the .cs project file. When we are developing Java binding stuff, sometimes you will have to edit .cs project file manually. Have anyone did that before? I mean, is there anyone who manu opened the text editor like VS Code to edit CS project file before? Actually, not a lot, not a few. I was surprised. <laughs> you guys are kind of expertized. <laughs> Or weird. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, the next topic is there are many build actions for Java uh, JAR ja file or AAR files in, within Java binding projects. And if you're trying to select the right one, you wonder what is the right choice. But basically, you can just use the default, the default action for jar file or AR file, which is like when you are adding some jar or AR into your project, they usually set the right, the right choice for you, <coughs> which is either embedded jar or library project zip. So you usually don't have to change them, but sometimes you have to. For example, when you are trying to distribute your Java binding library for some proprietary Java library that you cannot really ship. For example, we cannot really ship Google Play Services component because it is proprietary licensed by Google. So our Google Play Services library doesn't really actually embed their AR file. Instead, we use some different build action called input jar. And uh, okay, so something some, in some for some cases you have to choose some different build actions, but I'm not going to explain a lot now. The second weird uh, interesting topic is we have uh, the component team. I mean, the Xamarin component team had been developing some use uh, utility package called Xamarin.build.download which is useful when you are building and creating Java binding projects. Basically what it does is automatically, to automatically download the required Java files for you, I mean, or for app developers of your users of Java bindings. Sometimes, say, something like Google Play Services doesn't really embed the jar into the DLL, so you, uh, the user of your pro uh, co uh, library needs to separately prepare those Java libraries, but 
this library and this download stuff makes it easier. Like it makes it automatic if you use it. It is actually not really stable and maybe it's subject to change, but it's right now it's useful. So if you uh, if you want to do something like that, you want to use it. One of the problematic topic about the <coughs> library stuff is like you will have to carefully design how your DLL, the binding DLL, <coughs> depends on other libraries. Basically, it's better to replicate the Java library dependency hierarchy too uh, within your Java binding stuff too. Like for example, if your Java, bind, uh, Java library called b.java depends on the base uh, or some core class library called .a.jar and it's making use of the public classes from a.jar in b.jar. <coughs> when you're building some bindings, you will have to build another binding library for a.jar too because the depend derived classes in the derived jar file <coughs> will depend on the base jar stuff and all the let's go back uh, in the c shop code if you uh, have some classes called public class c2 which is derived from a.c1 this a.c1 needs to be in managed class too instead of a java class it's not enough if you just have some Java ref reference with that dotnet, that's mm -hmm. not enough. You need to have managed bindings. So basically, it's better to replicate this Java dependency, in uh, uh, Java dependency graph into the DLL graphs too. It is possible to bind one or more than one Java library within one DLL, but if you have some complicated dependency relationships between other DLLs. Sometimes at some stage say more than one DLLs could reference the same jar and it's going to be complicated. <coughs> they are basically conflict. And you know Java binding, uh, Java libraries are also versioned. So there could be like inconsistent ver two versions of the same library and the build system wonders which is the right choice to import <coughs> and that's going to be difficult actually we just choose one and the runtime behavior is unknown so you don't want to do that have that another messy topic around java binding library is that <laughs> java bind uh, the library us usually have oh sorry I, I should i should be showing this in presentation mode <laughs> A messy topic is usually Java bindings does not give the right parameter names. It always comes with like P0, P1, P2, and that, doesn't, that is not useful. But <coughs> you can actually specify, uh, give some parameter names. Or actually, you can import Java parameter names from Java documentation. It doesn't happen by default because Unlike .NET managed DLLs, our, uh, the Java library classes don't come up with parameter names. So we are just importing JNI signatures and they don't come up with parameters or, uh, parameter names. So we have to uh, give P0, P1, P2. But if you, uh, if you have Java docs, you can add Java doc Java file to the build or if they are uh, Android documentation, which is called Droid Doc, it is uh, still possible to add that. And if you add Java Doc Jar projects from the Maven, uh, usually they are Maven artifacts. If you are lucky, you have Java Doc Jar. I tried to do that for an the latest Android architecture component, and they, of course, didn't give the Android documentation, so it was not possible. <coughs> but any anyways. If you have Java doc Java stuff, you can add that to the project and then set Java doc Java build action explicitly because 
usually jar file is bound to embedded jar build action, which is like which guesses it is classes that you are adding Java doc. So this is actually really new, and I looked for the documentation. I couldn't really find it. <coughs> but if you are using and trying to set the build action from the ID, it's there. You can set that, and then you can give get the parameter names for the Java library and from the Java library. Another important thing is like when you are writing some code and you wonder what how to use this API stuff, usually it only gives the signature, but sometimes <coughs> it is possible to show more details from API documentation. Uh, C Sharp has some feature called uh, CSC slash docs. And <coughs> we can have the same kind of documentation from Java API too. Uh, it is basically specifying Java doc jar stuff and then specify another project option to specify generic XML documentation. It is general to a uh, common to any kind of .NET project. So if you specify this option, it is supposed to generate some documentation for the library too. Inter uh, with uh, the internals is like <coughs> it, it's using some tool called Javadoc to MDoc from Mono Project, which is mostly for Xamarin Android. So, okay, the project structure stuff is over. Now I'm gonna explain some metadata fix-up related stuff. Basically, I already explained a bit, but basically when we are building the bindings. You add, create a new project and Java libraries and add some Java uh, library references and build. And usually it doesn't build, giving a lot of errors or warnings. If you don't see any failures, build failures, you are very, very lucky. <laughs> Why does that happen? Because basically C Java is not Java. <laughs> There's always a couple of glitches between these two languages. For example, Java methods in a derived class can be covariant like the derived methods in the Java classes can be, uh, the parameter types can be more specific than the base class. Another glitch is that in Java, you can write some codes that is derived from non-public class with, uh, for the public class, which never happens in c -sharp, right? <laughs> but it's possible in Java. Java is a little bit weird in that term, context for us. We also have some problems, like, uh, I, mean, I mean, Xamarin brings the issue, the issue by ourselves because we basically make signatures uh, more like .NET, c sharp -ified. <coughs> For example, android.view.view class it becomes, it's and the, not that the package name is all in lower case, but in .NET we have Pascal case name. So Android becomes an, an, an Pascal case and view becomes Pascal case and the class name view, view is unchanged. But the package name, the last part of the package name and the class name conflicts. And that's problematic when you are writing some code. So basically we rename this thing slightly to be views instead of view. Another example is that <coughs> if we have some Java class that have come up with a field called changed, all in lower case, and some method that is called get changed. <laughs> they are going to be the same name. One is the property for the field, and the other one is for, oops, oops. The other one is for the propertized method. So we need to rename either of those. They are kind of annoying, but you know, importing the 
code, I mean, generating some code from some other language is always a mess. And it's just like XD, XSD or WSDL. Have you ever tried, if you have ever tried to import web references, there's always glitch between the actual in real world WSDL and XSD versus the actual code that we can generate. Not everything is automatically, automatically doable. We don't have a silver bullet. So what is metadata XML like? <coughs> it is f uh, for fixing class pass output, the <coughs> exported XML. Uh, basically, we have three kinds of operations. One is removing some extra node. And another one is to, uh, in contrast, add some node to the tree. And another uh, last one is to rename something or give some additional attributes on each XML API node. <coughs> Have you ever used XPass before? Not a lot. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Surprisingly. Okay. XPass is really actually not easy. I mean, it's not really modern. It was written, developed in 1998-ish, the previous century. <laughs> So it's quite old, but we, uh, XPath is almost the only choice that to make use and make it to manipulate XML stuff useful. <coughs> the, this, uh, I wrote very easy XPath stuff for dummies, <laughs> new people, uh, XPath newbies. You specify API in a package and name is something and some either class or interface name with some field or methods with name something and you can fill some parts <coughs> dot 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 dotted parts we have some expl uh, detailed explanation of what kind of parameter names or um, uh, api descriptions in some separate documentation called java bindings metadata i noticed that i didn't say about that this slide is actually already public. Uh, I put this on the speaker deck. If you look for monkeyfest.io on Twitter, you can find this slide. So you can read it locally. Okay, <coughs> so there would be a lot of build failures when you are dealing with uh, this finding with metadata stuff. So for the first thing you want to do is to find the, co the actual cause of the unexpected results. You basically want to specify the diagnostic logs to see what's causing the problem. It's just a, build a project option to specify. Oh, no, uh, it is an ID option to specify the log verbosity here. And when, whenever you have some build problem, the easiest build fix is always use some operation called remove node. It is to act, uh, literally remove the problematic node from the API XML. So it's like ostrich. You don't want to see the problematic node and you, uh, it wouldn't be bound. However, sometimes in some cases, removing node brings more problems like Say, if you are missing some types, uh, you are losing some types that is dependent on some other types. Usually, the binding generator skips generating code whenever it finds some missing classes. And re if anything is, was removed by this remove node operation, the dependent, dependent classes or interfaces or methods um, those members will be automatically removed. And you will usually get the build output <coughs> with those things removed. But it's usually useful. We actually have a lot of tips around how to fix the metadata things. And there are many trouble cases that I list here, like 10-ish, nine. And 
Actually, we have a lot of those covered on the separate documentation called troubleshooting bindings. I'm not going to explain this stuff a lot right now because it is already documented and I, it doesn't make a lot of sense to duplicate this effort. <laughs> I'm going to explain only a few bits. The first thing, easiest thing is to fix namespace and type name conflicts like android.view.view thing is the typical case of this one. So we need to rename the .NET namespace. Um, to, fix, uh, to fix this issue, you specify attribute node, uh, attribute pass to package, and name equal manage the name, and you give your namespace. Uh, we specify android.views for this case in mono.android. The second interesting case is like, to fix some inconsistent member, member accesses like in Java land, you can derive a protected method into public, which is not really doable in .NET. If you are doing the same thing in C sharp, this is an example of class of called foo, and foo has a protected method. And in C sharp, we bind it to protected virtual method. And in the derived Java class, it, is, it became public. And then if we generate public class, it will result in build failure, of course. And to fix this kind of issue, you specify So we always have to deal with these language differences. <laughs> and when you have some code in Java, oops, sorry. I think I'm missing something. The slide was weird. OK. Uh, let me use this slide and this page. When we are dealing with generics and say in Java we have an API called comparator uh, interface which takes a generic argument of T. And in, gen in generated API there is no generic information because Java doesn't really have a runtime generics and it's going to be problematic <coughs> if we have we bind, simply bind the interface with generics types. It is not going to be impossible to instantiate some generic type and generic bound type and cast to some C sharp class. That's go not going to be compatible. Like comparator int and comparator double are different in .NET at runtime. So we cannot really bind the, those generic arguments. And that results in that, that we basically generate everything in java.lang.object. 
that's how we generate this interface arguments. Everything is object, not T. And when you are generating and uh, de deriving some class in Java, that can be, of course, instant. Uh, the generic type, of course, can be in instantiated. In this case, display name comparator class in Android content.pm is derived from uh, it implements comparator of application info class. But I mean, in uh, when we are binding this display name comparator class in C sharp, we have no idea that this Im method actually implements comparator t. It is not always the case that we uh, we it can be like more than one interfaces that can implement one method. So we basically simply implement this method in uh, import this method as is. Oh, it was a little bit weird. This should be Camel, a Pascal case. In compare, it will become application info, and it's not going to be regarded as implementation of this interface, and resulting in compi compilation error because it does not implement this I comparator thing. To fix this kind of issues, you can. The one of fix is to f change the parameter type to java.lang.object or anything that is specified in the generic arguments. We can use manage, uh, sorry, this should be manage type. I have some mistake. This is manage type. And then the second one is manage the return for the return value. You can, uh, you can also see some API description, and they are using type or return in uh, attributes in the API XML. But you cannot really change those those attributes because they are also used to generate some JNI related mem uh, code, and they need to be kept as is. So use managed something instead. Another weird problem is name collision in, uh, when we are generating event arguments. Like we are gen uh, converting some event listener method in Java interfaces. Like in in Java API, we have something like set on click listener, and you implement this set on click listener interface and de uh, define your method to define what we, whatever you are, you want to do. In C Sharp, we can just say click, <laughs> dot click plus equal or something. It's much easier. The, so we wanted to convert the Java interface, uh, listener interfaces to events. But for some cases, if there are many uh, more than one interface listener uh, types, and they needed to be converted to events within one class, they can sometimes result in conflicts. Oops. Say, Is it working? OK. So in C Sharp, they are converted to some event args class called complete event args or, and error event args. But two of, two of those interfaces
similarly use property name equal equal empty to disable property generation at all. It's not a build of fixes, but sometimes you want to beautify your managed API. Say, for example, we have Android.input method service package. So if you blindly convert this package name into .NET, it will become like Android. This A becomes la, uh, uppercase. And then input method service with M and S will be kept lowercase because we have no, no idea which, can, which should be uppercase in each case. So we manually specify manage the name to become Android input method service all in Pascal case. Sometimes we want to rename something that ends with system or Android. Because, you know, if, say, in Android API, we have dalvik.system package. But if you import, if you specify using dalvik.system semicolon, after that, you can't use any namespace, uh, classes from system namespace. That's going to be super messy, right? So we rename this stuff to Davik.system interrupt. The way how we name it is kind of arbitrary, and I always hope to bring some consistent naming, but it didn't happen in the first, and we have to keep compatibility, so we keep using uh, defining messy names. I feel sorry for that. Well, it's not my fault. <laughs> Someone who worked on this uh, stuff before. <laughs> Anyhow. You can also give some appropriate event names for the event listener method. Like, say we have some API called android.app.dialog.set on key listener. It is to set on key listener interface <coughs> to this uh, event. And we convert this method into event, but it will become like android.app.dialog.key. <laughs> but the event name key doesn't mean uh, make sense, right? So we wanted to make, uh, uh, we actually rena rename this to key press. Similarly, you can give some appro appropriate event args type name with args type attrib uh, attribute. For example, android.media.media.drm on dot event listener interface will result in the event name event args class called event event args, which is pointless. <laughs> so we wanted to rename this to media DRM event args. All of those changes are actually already in Xamarin Android source code, so you can read the how we do those things in GitHub repository. It is also important to know what Xamarin Android cannot do, knowing limitations. Like, if you are trying to bind some classes, but it never happens, and you wonder why it's not bound, and <coughs> if <coughs> you don't really have any idea that Xamarin Android cannot do that, it's going to, uh, you are going to waste time. <coughs> so we have documentation on how, what we cannot on limitation documentation page. Say so for example, one, one example is <coughs> deriving some concrete interface from base interface, uh, this generic interface. There's a, uh, some Android API called entity iterator, which extends from iterator interface of some generic type. It, the base definition only has E, but in entity iterator, <coughs> it specifies entity interface. But, but say in this interface, we have some method called next, which returns E, of course. It is iterator for E. So entity iterator is supposed to return entity, but the base interface 
iterator in C-sharp defines objects. It is supposed to return object, but entity iterator, what should this return? <laughs> should, should it return object or entity? And it has no, we have no idea, so we cannot really support this kind of generation. Uh, these are the limited uh, trick uh, problems and troubleshooting the metadata fix up things. All other, uh, we, I have listed many other topics and they are already in troubleshooting bindings documentation. So you want to check out that stuff later on and Xamarin Android website. <laughs> Lastly, I still have like 10 minutes-ish. I'm going to talk about some future topics. <clears throat> One of the limitation regarding Java 8 new feature is Java 8 makes it possible to define default interface methods, which is you can actually have some implementation in Java interface. It's a weird, right? Like <laughs> you can have an implementation in, in interface. But it is useful when you want to extend interface ability, but you don't want to break, uh, break the API. In that case, you can just define some interface with default behavior so that the existing interface de uh, derived in classes or interfaces from that interface can still compile. It is useful. But the problem is that c -sharp doesn't really support that yet. <coughs> Fortunately, the c -sharp pe team is going to support it. And it is already partly done in both Roslyn and Coursera. Coursera already has some work done in their own branch. It is not just in master. And Roslyn has something similar in the pull request, but I don't think it's merged yet to any branch. So we are going to make use of it if it's doable. I hope it is doable. It should be fairly just common between those new feature in Java 8 and C Sharp future. Another interesting case is like, I have been recently working on the new library and called Android Architecture Components. Anyone knows Android Architecture Components here? No <sighs> Surprising. <laughs> It is actually very new stuff, and cool stuff from Google, and it is basically to bring some object model to manage li activity life cycles. So whenever your application starts and re uh, suspends, I mean goes back and re uh, resumes, everything will be reported appropriately. It is really useful for managing the state. It is called activity life cycles. And they also have some co something called a view model, which is different from whatever you think about view model. It is quite different. <laughs> not, not totally, not the same as MVVM stuff. But they have their own API called view model. And they also have some persistency framework called Room. They are all new in, from Google I.O. Uh, 2017 this year. It is actually problematic because some new life. Have you ever heard of data binding stuff? Android data binding. Not a lot. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Google has been um, writing some libraries that depends on post processing steps called apt. And they make use of a grade or build test to make it possible. And when you are using Java bindings, data binding is blocked. Uh, data binding stuff is using this apt tool, but it is it basically works only for the Java code. And of course, we are .NET, and we can't do the same. The binding apt tool works only for the Java code, and it's not automatically doable for .NET code either. So. We have to do some special trick for that, and data binding was impossible. The Android architecture component was kind of possible. I replicated their behavior and re implementing everything in post processing code generation MS build task. It is doable by extending MS build tasks for each NuGet package in case you have never tried. 
So I was trying to do that, but there were some blockers. And basically, when you are generating some Android code, they are resulting in weird package name. And we ha I had to fix that. It, it, la it has already landed in Xamarin Android master. Master means like you wouldn't be able to use it for like maybe six months ish. It's super far away. But it will be landing later at some stage. So they are the new stuff. So, so far it's all, all done. Lastly, I have a, I showed a lot of links from the slides. So if you can see the slides from speaker deck, you can actually track those links. Not from now, you can, you can only read the text. Okay, thanks for coming to this session. It was really a kind of advanced session <laughs> that of some of you guys have enjoyed it. Thank you so much. <laughs> and lastly, we are sponsored by those Xamarinas and Sync Fusion and Microsoft. Thank you for the, those companies. <laughs> oh, yes. I should be around here for a while, so I was not, I, I didn't have any idea, but yeah, you can, you can give questions right now. Uh, okay, uh, let's assume that uh, I'm a .NET developer, but I never worked uh, with, uh, neither with Java nor with uh, Android before. Right. And uh, uh, I decided to use uh, uh, those API dialog uh, key press. Right. How am I supposed to find information? Okay, I started Visual Studio. I created a, a project uh, for Xamarin uh, Forms. I see uh, with the Object Explorer that uh, there is dialog.keypress. But how to use it? What, I, I, what is it for? I, I think I should go to the Google Docs, that is uh, Android Google, documentation <laughs> and discover that um, uh, there was a, a namespace mango. I need to dis uh, dis uh, discover the original uh, package name, original right. class name, original method name, and only after that I can read about uh, what uh, is uh, the event uh, key press Oh, that is actually a good question. Yeah, like when you're trying to use those Java uh, Android ori originated API, you wonder which type is uh, or method is mapped to the Java Android API, right? That's a question. So yeah, basically it is not really easily doable. We have documentation on Java Android references, and sometimes they, I think they basically import Java documentation. So if you look for those ones, uh, you you would find oh this is from this method from Java API that kind of stuff, but you usually don't want to do that. Uh, instead, we, we don't uh, have an exhaustive documentation about Xamarin uh, forms and uh, and uh, th that was a, just a very simple example. But what if I want to work with a camera and it requires uh, the several stage uh, to initialize that, then uh, initial uh, subscribe to that event, uh, and uh, it should be uh, uh, then uh, do another thing just uh, to take a picture from cam. You mean the Android API or something for uh, the form? I mean uh, that uh, uh, I need a reference uh, from. Uh, how if I, if I see th something in a, uh, as a, a Xamarin API, uh, how can I, I find a documentation uh, from a Google uh, uh, website? For so the something need to, to map from usually one, those from names are almost the same. So usually you can find say and say for example when you're using dealing with cameras that like you we have android.hardware.camera API. So you, usually they are mapped. Sometimes we don't really have uh, the right uh, one by one name mappings like like example uh, I explained like davic.interof that is quite different but uh, to find that kind of stuff, maybe you need you, you will have to find any 
attributes that we write on the source code that is actually it's hard to explain like we have mono.android dll and it has all those metadata there's no direct documentation stuff right now but you can see uh, if you have some api metadata reflection tool to look up what kind of register attribute has and what kind of register attribute value has, it, it would be possible to generate. Actually, when we build Xamarin Android, we of course generate all those c -sharp code first. So when we are looking for some types, when we want to look for some types, we just build Xamarin Android and then look for the, the mono.android API sources. <laughs> and then it, it is something like we can grab I know that there's no easy mapping information right now, but maybe I can I can generate something for <laughs> you guys. <laughs> but right now there's nothing. So you uh, it, there's a way to do it. Yeah. Um, there's an Android library that I'd like to eventually port to .NET so that I can use in summary. Um, uh, what's the best uh, way to contact you in terms of social media, email, or Twitter? Uh, Oh, maybe you can, uh, the, the easiest way to find some binding, you can usually even don't have to bind yourself. Usually, uh, I mean, yeah, if you're lucky, you. You, uh, if you're lucky, you can find a NuGet package uh, from any developer. And if you cannot, you will find, the best way to announce that is to publish the packages via NuGet. We used um, we used it, but you know, social medias are different in each country. Like, I use Twitter to post this slide. It usually works for most of the Japanese developers, but I used to live in Taiwan, and then Taiwanese don't really use Twitter a lot. <laughs> so it, there's no universal answer. So it has to be like, say, I have no idea what Singaporean use, <laughs> but if you say. You guys have some most popular social network. Maybe, maybe you want to use it. English uh, or uh, in the, in the US or maybe Twitter is popular too. So most of our team has Twitter account too, either active or inactive. <laughs> but the best way is maybe NuGet package. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It's Exactly about uh, binding, but uh, you have any any guidance on reducing the APK size? APK sizes? Yeah, because uh, I tried using the link curve, but then it would always result into a class not found. Class not found. That's yeah. not cool. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so you have like an automated tool that would monitor what which, which classes are being used for your for your application, so that. It do you have an idea which class not found thing? Is it in Javaland or? Uh, I think it's in dot .NET. <laughs> Basically, I think we have some documentation. I really have no quick idea, but uh, we, we should have some documentation about some linking related tips, like when you are using some API code um, that involves reflections. That's of course not going to be tracked by linker. So you need to have to manually add those types that are going to be used. Yeah, it's just so crazy. Like uh, it started out as 60 megabytes. Our app started out as 60 megabytes, and yeah. uh, I managed to to size it to like 30 or 20. Yeah, that's a great reduction. It involved a lot of trial and error. So if you have any idea on what's missing, or uh, maybe usually they are shown on the error. Yeah. Maybe you want to preserve the type, uh, specify the preserve, and maybe unless you are very unlucky, it wouldn't result in a huge <laughs> backlash. <laughs> usually we have, uh, there are some reasons like when you most I think it's mostly related to reflection-based invocation. It, we use uh, the assembly linker called CCL. Microsoft is going to use it. I mean, the, the .NET core team is going to use it 
as a, their default linker too. And they usually work quite well. But their case is that the linker cannot track. Um, yeah, she said, I don't think I was using any reflection, but. Uh, okay. Or, mm, yeah, I have no further idea. It, it is case by case. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, can you repeat again the URL for the back? The slide? Yeah. Uh, do you, if you use Slack, uh, Twitter, it is. Uh, 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 uh. Or you can look up my. Twitter uh, speaker deck account. I am Atsushi Eno. On, uh, <laughs> it's not really easy. Atsushi Eno. This one. Oops. This. The latest slide should be this one. Anything else? No? I will be still around here, so catch me and talk to me. Thanks. Thanks so much.